You ready to do this? Ready. Let's go. What did the fried rice say to the shrimp? Don't walk away from me. <sighs> did you hear Steve Harvey and his wife got into a fight? It was a family feud. <laughs> I do it. What kind of car does an egg drive? A small one. I don't know. A Yost wagon. <clears throat> How do dinosaurs pay bills? Tyrannosaurus checks. Mmm. <laughs> all right, all right, good one. All right, here we go. If Spaghetti made an action movie, what would it be called? Mission Impossible. <laughs> that one got me. <laughs> Where do sheep go for a haircut? I have no clue. The Baba shop. <laughs> wow, that is hilarious. <laughs> All right, here we go. What is Santa's favorite type of music? Santa's? Yes. Yeah. Christmas music. Wrong. Rap. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you imagine Santa listening to some rap? <laughs> Get it the wrapping paper. <laughs> yeah. What does it take to work at a zoo in Australia? No. Koalifications. <laughs> Koala. <laughs> Koala. <laughs> Yes, I love it, I love it, I love it. Why did the salad go to the studio? You got it, I don't know. To get some beats, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. What is Starbucks' favorite city? Uh, Fort Latte, though. Oh, <laughs> Fort Latte, <Dale. laughs> All right, all right, I get it, I get it, I can dig it. How do billboards talk? Sign language. <laughs> billboard sign language is a sign, that's crazy. Sign language. Sign language. What did Michael Jackson call his denim store? I don't know. Billy Jeans. Oh! <laughs> Billy Jean, wow. Good game, buddy. All right. Dads, I hope you guys wrote down some of those dad jokes because those are some good ones. Okay. <laughs> well, happy Father's Day. Before we jump into the message, we want to honor two special dads in the room. So we've got something special for you. And that is we're going to we've got some recliners, some snacks, some drinks back here um, all set up for you guys. And so. Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to start with the person that's been the dad the longest, okay? Um, so how many of you guys have been a dad five years? Just raise your hand. Been a dad for over five years. Over five years? Okay. How about over 10 years? Keep them up if you're over 10. Okay. Over 20? I still got my hand up back here, okay? Over 30 years. That, that knocked me out of the running. Okay. How about this? Over 40 years? Okay. Here we go. Okay. 45? Four, Travis, what do you got? 41? <laughs> okay. I, I, think you, I think you have it. We have a special recliner over here and snacks. And we want to invite you yet to come. You can kick your feet up. There's drinks. There's snacks. There's that stuff back there. And then for another special dad. All yep. right. So now we're looking for the newest dads. If you've been a dad for less than a year, will you raise your hand? Anybody less than Anyone? a year? Okay. okay. Oh, hold on. Am I only seeing what? Yeah. She's like, does this count? <laughs> okay. We got a couple that are less than a year or just one. Okay. I'm trying to see. Is this a Anyone hand? else have your hand up? 
No? Okay. Jo- All right. And how jo- long? Call it out. Oh, 11 months. 11 right. months? Okay. All right. You guys okay, can so head Okay, so dads, yeah, if you want to stand up, you can go back here New to dad, the recliners. Older We have dad. some special snacks back there for you. Our only request is don't fall asleep, okay? So there you go. Yep. Let's give them a hand. And we want to recognize all of the, the dads, um, both joining us online and also in the room. And we know that, you know, we say this every year, but for some of us, this is a joyous day as we celebrate our fathers and the impact that they had on our lives. For others, you know, this may be a little bit more of a difficult day if you have a broken relationship with your father or um, if you've had a father that has passed away. And so we just want to let you know wherever you're at um, in that scenario, we're thinking about you, we're praying with you, celebrating with you today. And we want to take a moment and honor our dads. And as some of you guys may know, um, this is my second Father's Day celebrating um, without my dad. He, he passed away a little bit over a year ago. But my dad, I think we have a picture of him up here Um an amazing man of God. This is me, my brother, and my dad, and um, just a great pastor, a great father, an amazing spiritual example, and everything that I know um, as a dad, everything that I've learned is because of the example that he was to me, and so I love my dad. I'm just amazing man. Yep. Yeah, and I want to honor my dad. Um, My dad had the distinct honor of being in a household with six women, Five daughters and his wife. The only male companion he had was our dog, and he went outside as much as he possibly could. So uh, somehow he survived all of us. I'm sure there were rougher days and and smoother days, but uh, my dad has battled a lot through his years, and he continues just to demonstrate the heart of a servant. My kids always know when he's around, he's like washing my floors or like detailing my car. Um, he's always trying to serve and just set that example, and I'm so thankful for him. And I also want to honor my favorite dad, which is Aaron. Um, and uh, <laughs> So, yep, we love you. You're an amazing dad. Thank so you. So thankful for you. So today we want to, I wanted to share a message with you called Play the Man. And it's not just for fathers in the room, but also for all men. And there's some challenging things that I think every one of us can take away um, that God wants to speak into our life, that it is good for us to have in our life. And so it comes from this book um, written by a pastor named Pastor Pastor Mark Batterson. And so I want to give away a copy of this to someone in the room. So... Um, if you're a guy and you don't have this book, this is an amazing book for dads. Who do you want to do? Okay, Hunter, right here up front. Okay, not just, um, yeah, but this is a, a great book for everyone. And where that phrase comes from, in case um, you're like, well, what exactly does that mean, play the man? Um, there was an early church leader named Polycarp. And he lived right after the time um, of what most of the New Testament after it was written and was the bishop of or was the pastor of in a town called Smyrna and had served Christ all of his life. And towards the end of his life in his 80s, he was brought before Roman officials and they challenged him. They said, Polycarp, we we're we're telling you, you need to renounce Christ or your life is going to be taken. And he said, you know what? I've served Jesus for 80 years. I'm not going to renounce my Savior. And so they bring him into this large Roman arena into the Colosseum. And he's brought before people. He's going to be burned alive at the stake. And so once again, they're like, recant Christ. So deny Jesus and say that Caesar is Lord. And over and over again, he declares, I'm not going to do that. I'll give up my life in this powerful moment. And it said this voice from heaven spoke to him and said, be strong, Polycarp. Play the man. Be strong, Polycarp. Play the man. And he did that day. He gave his life for his faith in Christ. And that challenge that no matter what we're facing, no matter what obstacles are in front of us, no matter what opposition we're facing in our life, that challenge to not compromise, to not give in, but to be strong and be the person that Christ has called us to be. That's the challenge that I want to give to you today, that that kind of life, that we would live that kind of life. And I think there are some characteristics that go along with that. And that's what I want to share with you today. And my prayer is that each of us would take away something that God could challenge us, that we would be able to step up and be the person that God has called us to be. Yeah. And the first 
point we're going to discuss today is that playing the man means redefining being tough. Playing the man means redefining being tough. And I, I think that the way that the world portray, portrays tough and the way that the scriptures shows us what tough actually means is very different. This isn't about tough love like correction and uh, you know being, coming down on your, on your kids or on the people in your life. Like There are times for that. But this kind of tough is something, it's like a strength that comes from within us that helps us to, to love well, consistently and faithfully over time. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6 says, Many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person who can find. We can say that we love, but that true love is shown in being faithful. And, and sometimes being a dad, being a man that loves well is hard. It's really, really difficult. It's challenging. And so redefining what it means to be tough, that's what it looks like to play the man day in and day yeah. out. And I think it's hard many times because there are so many of us who haven't had that example maybe of what it means to love well and the strength that comes whenever we love well. And when you look at our culture and the world around us, we're told that almost one out of every four kids, over 25% are raised in a household without a godly father, without a role model, without a dad there to even be an example in their life. And what happens in our life when we don't have that role model, when we don't have that father figure, statistics tell us that 71% of high school dropouts did not have a male figure in the household to be that example, that 70% of juvenile correction centers are filled with young people that did not have that male example in their life. 75% of adolescent patients in substance abuse centers did not have that strong male presence in their life within the household. And it can be devastating. And what Proverbs is, is reminding us of it's easy to say, I love you. It's easy to kind of voice things like that. But what it, what's powerful is an unfailing love that is consistent and that is faithful. A faithful man who can find. Someone that is going to be there day in and day out. And can I tell you, that's what's tough. That's the difficult thing is just being present. Part of it is just showing up, man, showing up, dads, to be there, to be consistently faithful to those around us that God has called us to love. And we need that example. And can I tell you, we need that example, not just for those that um, we have had our own kids, but we need that example in the church of godly men that are going to be faithful, that are going to be that example to others that need to see that in your life, that need to see that example, that what it means to be a man of God, a faithful man who can find. God is challenging us to do that. So play the man. It means redefining what it means to be tough and loving well those around us. Yeah, John 15, 13, it says, greater love has no one than this. We know this verse, right? but that a man would lay down his life for one's friends. And, and I know I've said this before. We all would probably jump in front of a car, right? You see a little kid standing out in the street, and we're all going to go out there. That's not what this is saying. This is laying down your life day in, day out, laying aside your wants, your desires, your career, the things that matter to you for what is best for the people God has entrusted to you. And I think sometimes, again, culture gives us this picture of what it looks like to be tough, like to puff ourselves up and to be really, really strong and tough and protected. But honestly, true strength is demonstrated when we're willing to lay things down. When we're willing to say no instead of always saying yes. When we're willing to make the difficult decisions. Yeah, and I think a powerful example that, that I read of this was um, a story that was in a newspaper in 1992. And it was about, it was about um, the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. And his name was Larry Trapp. And Larry Trapp in his community had terrorized, um, had um, full of hate and, and just horrible things towards people that were not like him, other backgrounds, other cultures, other ethnicities. One of the people that received a lot of the hate mail and the threats and those different things was a man named um, Michael Weiser. And he had received death threats. He was the leader of a Jewish synagogue and, and received a lot of threats towards the people in the synagogue. And then one day, Larry Trapp, the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, tore up his Nazi flag he destroyed his hate literature that he had, and he renounced the KKK. 
And it was because of this. Whenever he was dying of a kidney-related um, disease that was related to diabetes, he was unable to care for himself. And Michael Weiser invited him into his home, put a bed in a room, took care of him, was basically his nurse, like cared for him, made sure he had everything that he needed. And eventually, it didn't start like that, but eventually Larry said, he showed me so much love. How could I not help but love him back? And you guys, this powerful love that even towards those, those of us that would maybe do us harm, that would hate us, right, that would, that would be so difficult to love, and yet we're called this tough, powerful love that Christ so beautifully demonstrated towards us when we were his enemies, when we were opposed to him, and yet he came and loved us in this powerful call that we have to love others well, to lay down our life, to be that example of love towards others that Christ has called us to be. I, I think what seems so difficult about that and crazy is that he was so vulnerable. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, the level of, of vulnerability of bringing someone who is hateful into your own home. Um, and again, that goes against that nature of like, we think of tough and we think of puffed up and like defensive, but this kind of tough love is vulnerable yeah. and, and there's a risk involved. Like if we love like this, we'll, we can get rejected. We will get hurt, but this is the kind of love that the world is looking for is this kind of love that endures, that is faithful, even in the, the midst of hatred yeah. or uh, of danger, even again, laying down our lives daily to serve those around us. Yeah. And so I, I want to challenge you this morning, church, that this week, even over these next few days, that you would look for those kind of opportunities. And once again, we may think grand gesture, you know, you may think something big, what's something over the top that I can do. But can I tell you one of the most powerful things that you can do, just faithfully and consistently love those around you that God has placed in your life. Look, what are those small moments to just be faithful in your love, to be consistent, to lay down maybe some of your wants and your desires to serve those that God has placed around you and that you would be a reflection of the love that Christ has towards us, to those around us, that they would see that kind of love of playing the man means that we redefine what it means to be tough and that we as the people of God, that we love well those that God has placed around us. Yeah. Playing the man also means we never stop learning. Yeah. We never stop learning. I love, there's so many stories about President Teddy Roosevelt. I so wish I could have known this dude because he just lived a crazy adventure. If you look up some of the stuff that he did, he rode a moose, um, took down an armed cowboy during a barroom brawl, crossed a frozen river to chase boat thieves, worked a ranch in the Dakotas, flew a Wright Brothers airplane, scaled the Matterhorn in the Swiss Alps, went on month-long African safaris. The list goes on and on. This man was incredibly adventurous. But he's also known, even when he was the president, and I'm sure he had an incredibly crazy schedule, to read at least an average of 500 books a year. Now, we read a ton of books in the Aska house. If you've ever been to our house, we have a wall of books. We read so many books. I don't think all of us combined read 500 books a year. Um, but here's the thing that's so powerful about that is that he recognized that he didn't know what he didn't know. Yeah. Like he stayed curious and was known to be curious and continually looking at the world in this like childlike wonder. And so being a man and playing the man means like constantly being aware and learning and never stop learning, constantly looking for new information. And, and Jesus was like this. We yeah, see this in was. his life that he said an example in Luke chapter two, verse 52, it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Yeah. And I think sometimes when we see that verse, we're like, okay, but he was already God, right? Like he already knew everything that he needed to know, but Jesus was also fully human. And that's what this verse is talking about, that he grew in this wisdom. Now, whenever my brother and I were younger, we did something called Bible quiz. I don't know if anyone has ever JBQ? heard of this. Anyone? Okay. Um, anyone? But what puzzle. it was is, yeah, it was like a game show. Yeah. And you were one team, and you'd face this other team, 
and you had buzzers and there was someone up front reading questions and you had to study the Bible. Like some of it, you had to quote scriptures or tell them where it was found out in the Bible or talk about what it meant to be a Christian. Like there were all of these different questions. There was hundreds and hundreds. And one year, my brother and I won state champions. Okay. Claim um, to fame. That's my one claim to flame, fame. Like he okay, was yep. known at college. Yes. They were okay. the, the JBQ yep, state, state champions. champions in the state of Arkansas. Okay. Yes. <laughs> And it took, I think, man, it took so many hours of studying, but we were challenged by my dad of, hey, never stop learning. And even though we were in church every week, even though I had heard hundreds of sermons because my dad was a pastor, my dad challenged us like, never stop learning. Keep growing in your relationship with God and knowing God's word and what that is. And when we look at Jesus, that's the kind of person that he was. We see him at the age of 12 and his family has taken off and he's back at the synagogue, the church, the temple of his time. And he's asking questions and he's listening and he's reflecting on what is being said. He's growing and he's learning. Have you ever thought about the 30 some years that we don't know about the life of Jesus? We're not told anything. Well, he's not just sitting back doing nothing for that time. He's reflecting on scripture. What is he doing? He's growing in wisdom. Before he ever gets up and preaches a message, before he ever teaches crowds of people, 30 some years of studying God's word, reflecting on God's word, growing in favor with God and with man. This is a person who set that example. Jesus was that example of continuing to learn and grow and develop. And we need to be that kind of people too, that we're allowing ourselves to continue to learn that we never stop growing in this area of our life of gaining wisdom. Yeah, and parents, if you miss that, there's your out. If you forget your kid at church ever, you're in great company because yep. Jesus' parents left him there too, and he was just fine. Um, but Solomon, here's what's crazy. Like Solomon known the wisest man in the, in the world, right? Like he asked God for wisdom, God grants it to him. And in my mind, as a younger person, I always thought like, you know, he had it. Like God gave him wisdom and he had it. But if you look in Proverbs over and over and over again, and just Proverbs 4 verse 5 says, get wisdom. Solomon's talking to his kids. Like he's passing on this, this knowledge and he says, get wisdom, get understanding. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. He repeatedly personifies, I'm an English teacher, personifies wisdom as this character that you pursue, right? And she's going to watch over you. And so even Solomon, who's granted wisdom, wisdom says, keep getting it. Like yeah. keep digging for it. Don't stop. Don't think I've arrived. I know everything that I need to know and I'm good now. Like consistently be getting curious and digging into the world around you and then passing on that knowledge. You see like Solomon writing books of the Bible to pass on all the wisdom that he could to his yeah. children because he felt the burden of all the lessons that he had learned. And the day that we stop learning, we're dying, you guys. We're either growing daily or we're dying gradually. And so if we consistently just kind of settle in and think, you know, I think I got just about everything and I need to get down. No, you don't. That's the first place you're going to slip. Keep digging into God's word. Keep discovering more knowledge and yeah. more wisdom. There's always something new that we can discover and you never know who might need to hear that from you. Yeah. And a great leader once said, live as if you'll die tomorrow, but learn as if you'll live forever. So live as if you'll die tomorrow, that adventurous spirit that God has given us, but learn as if you'll live forever. Keep growing, keep learning. And it's not just so that we have more knowledge, but it affects the way that we live and even the way that we see the world. And I was listening um, to a TED talk and it was talking about this, how astronomers, like we go out in the night sky and we see the beautiful stars and we're like, hey, all of that looks really neat. But when an astronomer looks at that, they see something totally different. They see all of the constellations. They see planets orbiting and moving in the heavens. Like they know what's taking place up there and things that are being formed because they have that knowledge. They see the world differently. Like we may go to um, a musical concert hall and we may hear something and think, man, that sounds really great. But a musician, a skilled musician knows how the instruments are coming together. They know every chord and every melody and everything that's happening there. Why? Because they've learned more. They see and they hear that differently. And we're learning more. Like we understand how with science that the way that you think it's forming new pathways in your mind. 
And that means it doesn't mean like I get to 60 or 70 and now I know it all. No, there are still new things that can be formed. The way that you think can form new ways of you seeing the world, interacting with the world. It's not just about knowing more, but it begins to impact the way that you live your life. And so we never want to stop growing in wisdom. It kind of makes yeah. me think about when we watch like American Idol and you're like, can that person sing really well? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, they, they're doing really, yeah. really well um, <laughs> because I can hear it, but you cannot. Yeah. And I, what I think about this when I hear, I'm hearing you talk is there's this practical side of passing on that knowledge. I know Aaron's dad, uh, we were only dating. I don't think yeah. we were engaged and he worked at a mechanics place and he like put the car up on the lift, you know, and like took me under the car and was like showing me how to change my oil, how to change my transmission yeah. fluid. Here's how you know that it's transmission fluid and not oil is the color. And, uh, you know, all these little nuances. So passing that on, teaching people how to change a tire, how to do practical things that you know how to do. And then there's the, there's the spiritual side yeah. of passing down. How do I handle when I feel frustrated and angry? How do you handle when you're facing a really difficult situation at work and you can't control the other person? Like whether you're doing this intentionally or accidentally, you are teaching the people around you what you know and do not know. And so either we do that with intentionality and pass down, man, here's how I handle the difficult emotions I have. Here's how I process through when I'm having a rough day. Here's how I handle these difficult situations that I face day in and day out. Here's how we fight. Here's how you learn how to healthfully have an argument with your spouse, right? We are passing those things down on this deep level with intentionality and not just assuming through osmosis they're going to pick everything up yep. by watching us. Yep. That's good. And so we have that challenge. Playing the man means we never stop learning. And playing the man means being a spiritual leader. And so Paul challenges us with this in Ephesians chapter five, verse 23 for the, the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, Paul challenges men to lay down their life for their spouse, for their family, just as Jesus laid down his life in Ephesians six, four fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of of the Lord. And so we have that challenge to be a spiritual leader, to be that spiritual example, to reflect Jesus in our life and all that we're called to do. And I think yeah. sometimes I'll just say, so sometimes there's women who don't like this. There are people who don't like this that say, I don't, you know, nobody's over me. Like nobody has leadership, leadership in this kind of leadership that Christ is talking about. This is not being the boss. This is not being a, an authority that pushes down and tells people what to do. It's leading by serving. Yeah. It's leading by That's influence. Right. That's what this looks like in the day to day. And so for the, the women and children in the house, this is meant to be a covering right? A protection that I know. And I tell my kids this all the time. We're going to talk through things. And at the end of the day, I'm going to trust his leadership and wisdom. You know why? Because he's going to answer to God one day for it. Yep. And so I trust him because I know he understands the weight of what that means, that God has placed that level and that mantle of leadership on his shoulders. And I think we can trust that. We can trust that when we know that you're leading by example, you're leading with the heart of a servant, laying down your life yeah. every single day. Yeah, that's what we're called to do. And when we are that spiritual leader, other people are impacted and they're going to see that in your life and it's going to make a difference in them. I remember one of my good friends, Jamie, um, was, he is a missionary in a South Asia Pacific country and he was traveling. This is when he was first going to go over there. He's been over there for quite some time now, but he was first traveling and, um, he had to go from church to church every day, meeting with pastors, like he'd have coffee and kind of share the vision of what they were going to be doing in this specific country and, and what that would look like. And so he had a meeting with my dad. My dad was a pastor in Illinois where he was traveling around. And I'll never forget, Jamie called me after he met with my dad. And he said, Aaron, you know what? I just have to tell you this. He said, I've met with hundreds of pastors. I've been at hundreds of churches now. And he said, I've never met a man like Angel Escamilla. And he said, at the end, your dad turned to me and said, Jamie, can I just pray for you? And Jamie was like, yeah. And he's like, as your dad started to pray, he's like, I immediately got this sense. This pastor has been with Jesus. Like the presence of God was just in that room. He's like, it was a simple prayer. It was not long, but he said, man, I knew I was sitting in the presence of someone that had been with Jesus. And church, that's what a spiritual leader is. 
is that when your life and my life reflect Christ in such a way that other people know you have been with Jesus. That your presence and my presence, uh, what we carry, it's God's spirit working through us. And it's now impacting people in your workplace. Students, there are your friends that are in that classroom with you. And they know there is something different about you because you carry the presence of God with you. That we would stand up in that way. We would be that example and that person that Christ has called us to be. That's what it means to play the man. That God would shine through us in that way. That's what we need to be for the world around us. You know, we started this whole message with a man named Polycarp, an early Christian leader. When you look at his life, and Sarah and I, we were even kind of talking beforehand, and we were trying to piece it all together because the Bible tells us that he was a disciple of John, one of the guys that followed Jesus. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Early church leaders, yeah, tell us that he was a disciple of John, who we read about in the Bible. And when you look at that, like we were trying to piece it together because John would have been an older individual, like maybe in his 70s and 80s when Polycarp was a teenager. And I want you to think about that. This 70, 80-year-old man who had been a disciple of Jesus finds this teenage boy and begins to pour into him. And Polycarp then becomes this pastor in this town and has this tremendous legacy where we're told the Roman Empire began to shift because of the example of what he did in the arena that day as he gave his life. And there may be those of you in this room that are like, but I'm not a dad or I'm not a mom. Or I'm past that age. Like my kids, they're, they're out of the house. And can I tell you, we need more people in their 60s and 70s that are finding students and teenagers and saying, let me walk alongside of you. Let me be that example. Let me pray for you. Let me encourage you. Let me challenge you in the way that you're walking with Jesus. We need more people being that kind of example that are pouring into the next generation. This isn't just about a biological father or a biological mother. This is us as a church stepping up and saying, we are gonna be there for the next generation to be that example. That's what Christ is calling us to do. That's what we're being challenged to do. And so I want to encourage you to play the man, to be that person, to be that example that God wants you to be for those around you. And I want to pray over us. If you would take a moment and just bow your head and close your eyes. And even for those of you watching online, and just take a moment and reflect at your own life. And you may be here this morning And what we've been talking about, you may feel disconnected from God. We've been talking about being that example for others, but maybe you've never taken that first step of entering into a relationship with Jesus, of being close to your heavenly father. And the Bible is very clear as he is a good and loving heavenly father. He gave his son, Jesus came and gave his life so that we could be brought back into a right relationship with God. And if you're here this morning, one of the most powerful and meaningful things you can do on Father's Day is to reconnect with your Heavenly Father. To come back into a right relationship with God. The Bible says that sin separates us and sin divides us from God. And Jesus made the way on the cross when he gave his life for us. And if that's you, I want to lead us in a prayer. And I'm going to invite you to say this out loud with me, everyone here and you may be alone in your house but i want to encourage you to pray this out loud because we don't want anyone praying this alone so join with me in praying this god i come to you i recognize i need you in my life i know that i've sinned and sin separates me from you so forgive me come into my heart be the savior of my life be the Lord of my life. Let me start a new relationship with you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Church, can we just put our hands together and celebrate for anyone that may have prayed that prayer and committed their life to Christ? The Bible says that heaven is rejoicing, that your heavenly Father is celebrating with you because of that decision that you've made this morning. 
And I just want to pray over everybody in the room, everyone worshiping with us online. Let's just take a moment, just examine your heart, and just ask, what do you feel challenged by today? What has God's word spoken to you and what and what's next for you? And let's just open our hearts to the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for challenging us, for uh, continuing to grow us, Lord, for loving us enough to not just let us stay the same, but to continue to, to make us and mold us more and more into the image of who you've created us to be. And God, I, I pray this morning that we would just submit our lives to you. Help us, Lord, to set the example with a, a new definition of what it means to be tough and a, a, a faithful, humble, vulnerable love that you, you showed us so willingly and so openly when you were here with us on earth, Jesus. God, I pray that you would help us and, and challenge us, Lord, to always be curious, always be learning, continually pursuing the wisdom that you give so willingly to us, Lord. And God, help us to set the example, to be a spiritual leader, no matter where you've placed us, whether that's in a classroom as a student, whether that's in a job as a leader, God, whether that's in a family, Lord, as an aunt or uncle or grandparent or parent, wherever you place us, help us to set an example. Lord, the example that you set while here on earth, Lord, that you continue to show us as a good father, as we've sung about this morning, help us to reflect your character and all that we say and do and to carry that mantle of leadership and that burden god to pass on the wisdom that you've entrusted to us lord our lives are yours our hearts are yours all that we have belongs to you it came from you and so we just resubmit it to you we ask you to have your way in jesus name we pray amen